Science today has some monumental challenges to tackle. Scientists have to develop new biofuels for our environment, for example, and new antibiotics to combat increasingly resistant bacteria. Achieving this requires more studies of our material world on a molecular level. But to see the smallest things, we sometimes need the help of very big things. Things like the massive structure emerging just outside of Lund, Sweden today. It is a super microscope. You could say it works like a big X-ray machine. But unlike the one used in your local hospital, this one utilizes a light which is so intense that it can show things which are almost invisible. Small material components such as molecules and atoms. This light is called synchrotron light. And it plays an indispensable role for many major fields of research. What we are doing here is to try to look a bit deeper into the invisible world because we understand more and more how powerful this world is. It has a very strong impact on our lives, for our health, also our living standard, the economy, and of course also for the environment. We are of course very interested trying to understand how it acts and hopefully in the future that we can have an impact on it as well. The new laboratory for seeing the almost invisible is called MAX-4. It is going to be the world's most brilliant synchrotron light laboratory, built with the help of the Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation. The man responsible for the laboratory's new innovative technology is its machine director, Mikkel Eriksson. What will happen is that MAX-4 will be the first very high, brilliant source and that will give us a possibility to just see things which haven't been seen before. MAX-4 is as large as the Colosseum in Rome, but it isn't built for gladiators. It was built for electrons. Electrons are accelerated to near light speed in a tunnel. Then they are led into a large ring where they swirl around with the help of magnets, causing these electrons to emit a very intense light, a synchrotron light. The radiation from the accelerator can be dangerous, but today it is turned off, and Mikhail can take us to the other side of the meter-thick concrete doors. So what we're seeing here is the tube in which the electrons are traveling with the speed of light. This tube is very tiny compared to what we have today. This is in fact only some two centimeters in di diameter. In just one day, each of the electrons in the narrow tube spin around nearly 50 billion times. Holding them in the right place and keeping them from crashing into the walls of the tube is achieved by using many magnets with different characteristics. And most important are the dipoles here, which bend the beam slightly. And we have 140 of those dipole magnets, and together they form a closed orbit. So the electrons can go round and round and round and round. These different magnets play a central role in this state-of-the-art facility. But the history of Max began quite simply. Over 30 years ago, Mikkel was there for the building of the very first Max laboratory, which was more or less a homemade project. The first machine, which was called simply Max, was completely, almost completely home built. So we had to find cheap solutions all the time. And there was a great amount of ingenuity. For example, when the scientists even borrowed a clothing press or a ringer from the mother of one of their colleagues to glue the magnets together. Put the epoxy glue on the rolls, put in the plates, and had a series of production of magnets. 
And that worked beautifully, except for one sad thing. The ringer was completely destroyed afterwards. I never dared to visit him after that. In spite of the low budget, Max 1 was a success and paved the way for Max 2 and Max 3, all supported by the Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation and all under Mikael's supervision. Max 3 served as a testing facility to bring forth new technology, which now will help the full-scale Max 4 to be a world leader. One part of this involves using smarter magnets. Whereas previously a few large magnets were used, they have successfully developed several different kinds of smaller, more effective magnets. The greater the number of magnets that will fit into the available space, the more focused the electron beam will be and the more intense the light. In the very start, I, I mean, I, I must say that we were afraid of that technology. Our colleagues were skeptical, to say the least. But uh, and that uh, turned out to work quite well. With the help of those new magnets, the light beam from Max 4 will be 10,000 times more brilliant than that of the Max Lab today and in doing so, it will lead the world. This is important, as the competition for attracting the leading scientific minds of today is fierce. Uh, it's so that the best researchers are often very demanding, so you've got to have an equipment which is first class, preferably best in the world, of course. It's not only the, the accelerator, it's the beam lines, it's the end stations, it's the computer facilities, it's the detectors, name it. You've got the, to have strong links in all the chain. It still looks a little desolate, but Max 4 will soon be filled with scientists from all over the world. It is expected that there will be 2,000 researchers visiting per year coming to work at the various experiment stations. The synchrotron light will be channeled from the big ring via beam lines and sent to different specialized experiment stations. There, teams of researchers from diverse fields will use the light to investigate their materials. One of these stations is Biomax. Thomas Ursby is the project manager here. So now we're arriving at Biomax and the uh, orange uh, radiation protection area. So we have uh, the beam, the X-ray beam coming out from this uh, wall, going through this uh, vacuum pipe and comes to a vacuum chamber, which is the mirror chamber. So there are two mirrors and the uh, purpose of those are to focus down this X-ray to a very small beam, which is about the same size the, as the sample which is uh, in there. So we're still lacking some of these vacuum pipes to come into the experiment touch. When all the parts of the beam lines are in place and Biomax is ready, it will be used as a specialized experiment station for studies in structural biology. Among other things, this includes the study of how proteins are built, which can play a crucial part in the production of new medicines. The scientists will come here with the protein samples that they want to have a closer look at. So the X-ray beam comes into the experiment uh, room in here, and then we have a sample that sits in one of these uh, standard sample holders. So on the tip of this uh, needle here is the actual sample that is then rotated. So we have the X-ray beam hitting this sample and it's scattered out. When the X-ray beam hits the proteins, it is refracted into a specific pattern. From this pattern, a computer can calculate and render a three-dimensional image of the protein. Among other things, this can show the exact locations of the atoms in the protein, knowledge that can help in developing drugs that work more effectively in the body. One of the researchers waiting for the completion of the installation is Maria Selmer from Uppsala University. She is researching proteins and antibiotics and the problem of increasing resistance of bacteria to our current medicines. We want to understand antibiotic resistance enzymes and how they can modify 
or degrade antibiotics so that they no longer have the desired effect. To understand all these processes at an atomic level, we need very intense X-rays. With MAX4 providing the world's most intense synchrotron X-ray light, Maria is hoping to make new advances in her research. I think it will lead to better understanding of the detailed processes of life and ultimately to the development of new and better antibiotics. For Mikael Eriksson, Max4 will be his last big project. Once the facility is up and running, he will retire. Mikael has devoted his entire professional life to synchrotron light, and he sees great potential for Max4 in the future. It's no secret that we have quite large challenges ahead of us. It's a growing population. This planet is getting more and more dirty. It has an effect on the climate. And uh, one can at least dream of that we can contribute to a more positive development. We have always seen how technology is driving science, as science is driving technology. But this is an interaction which is most exciting and it will be quite exciting to see what will come.